Um, the second is um, expanded content. Okay. So the um, discipline of world history has changed more than any other field of history in the last 20 years. That's because the field of world history is not very old, um, uh, speaking, you know, compared to U.S. history, an example. And um, since the, unless you have just gotten out of school or gotten out of school in the last 10 years or something like that, there's a lot of things that have happened and a lot of new interpretations that have been made of world history in that time period. So much so that it's almost turned the field upside down. All right, so this expanded content uh, is reflected in the framework. So one of the big messages I have for you as a takeaway is that you need to look for training in this new content and to press your administrators for training in this content. Um, and if you're an administrator, remember that your teachers are going to need this. This is substantially different than the, what they have taught before. Okay, so then the third area is literacy and language development. So this means uh, to um, uh, give the students, to give every student, um, including those ones that read below grade level and those that English is not their first language, to give them the ability to read sources and do this kind of difficult work, you know, by expressly supporting them uh, with uh, literacy and language development. And you'll see that in the framework, there are actually activities to support language development are actually written into the history framework. And it is completely aligned, therefore, with both the ELA and the ELD frameworks that have come out previously. That is, they're written across each other so that they support and include each other. Okay, the last area is citizenship. So now, this is, this is a, a funny one for sixth and seventh grade teachers. I'm sure it has occurred to you that probably that nothing you would teach would be more distant from 21st century America than the subjects that you teach at the sixth and seventh grade level, right? You know, it's old, uh, you know, the people, you know, they're substantially different, you know, different continents. I mean, it's just very, very foreign to them. And if we're supposed to be teaching students about democracy and having a practice democracy, uh, well, there's precious little democracy in our curriculum. That there are only really three democratic societies in the entire period from, you know, the, the, the sixth and seventh grade going up to the 1790s, there's, there's three, and that's um, Athens and the Roman Republic and then Britain, uh, you know, and none of them were particularly free. You know, there's substantial numbers of people who didn't get to be among the free people there. So what I like to think about, though, is I think there's a really important role for sixth and seventh grade curriculum in teaching citizenship, though, and that is that we teach them the opposite of democracy. That we teach them, we give them an example of what it was like when people were not free and did not have participation. And we try to, we try to show them what that kind of a model was like um, and uh, in hopes that you know, they will um, value the opposite and um, uh, value and support democracy um, in all its forms. Okay, so um, that being said, there also are examples um, in a, a little bit the, in the frameworks of things that you, uh, you know, suggestions for service learning projects and so forth, uh, but the, I see that as the main thrust of citizenship in the sixth and seventh grade. Okay. So, there's um, the focus in the um, new of best practices. The decisions about what to do in curriculum lies with local control. That might be your school district, it might be your principal, or it might be you or your, your collective <coughs> teachers at your school. So I'll give you my opinion, just my opinion on this question of inquiry versus coverage, okay? My opinion is that you cannot cover world history. It cannot be done. I have tried. I have tried and tried and tried to cover world history. I have knocked myself out running from one place to another across, you know, I did, you know, in, in high school and I taught at a community college and, and on and on and on. It can't be done. And if you try to do it, if you try to rush through all these strange places and strange names with the students, they don't remember any of it. Okay. All right. So. My thing, uh, my thing that when I teach now is I pick an important issue 
an important question. And I focus the whole lesson that I have on that question. And I go in depth on that question. And I have that case study, that uh, content that I give them in order to explore the question, that may be much, much deeper, um, if a really deep, and I have that stand as a case study. And then I pull out of that example and I say, this is what kingdoms were like in pre-modern times. Or, you know, make some generalization so that then they can um, apply it to all these other places that we didn't cover. So what, uh, what I would say on that, um, when you go into depth or coverage, okay, depth is better teaching and they retain more and coverage can't be done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, another, the last thing is that the framework specifically gives you, uh, this is a new edition, it specifically gives you primary sources and it tells you what excerpt of that primary source to use. I know that you cannot give a 20-page document to sixth graders. I understand that. So it tells you what two or three sentences you really need to use to get to the meat of the source. And then it'll give you activities to do with it. And we'll take a look at some of these in a little bit. So for every unit in sixth and seventh grade, uh, there is at least one a suggested specific primary source and an activity to go in it that you could use for depth. Okay. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about the massive changes in the discipline of world history over the last 20 years. Okay, so um, uh, now world history, um, in the last 20 years, world history has changed very, very significantly. But, and I have to say that world historians have not yet agreed upon a narrative. And so historians use that word narrative as like, what's the story of history? You know, is it What's the big theme that they're working across there? So there is no agreed on big theme. That is, uh, there, there are several uh, 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 popular ones that people follow. Um, I believe that someday there will be, that there will be a narrative um, to, in uh, world history the way there is in US history. And people may not agree on it, but they know that the revolution is followed by the early republic, which is followed by Jackson and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, you know, in world history, it's not there yet. So that means um, that there really aren't too many things that you can really hang on to as being, um, uh, as, uh, uh, being concrete in that way. But uh, there are a couple. One is this, that in the beginning of sixth grade, the world is uh, mostly divided into regions. That is, most of what happens in the early period is focused on one region or one locality. And then the localities are separated from each other. They don't have a lot of contact with each other. And over time, the world, the regions get more and more and more connected. Okay, so that by the time you get, like, and this goes all the way from sixth grade to 10th grade, and like it's more, it starts to get connected in sixth grade, much more connected in seventh grade than in the, then in 10th grade, it's the modern world, and it's like globalization at the end of it. So this is a pattern you can trace with your students from being more, um, more um, sort of individual, isolated, to being more connected in the world, for better or for worse. All right, second thing that you can um, talk about with your students is that in the all of sixth and seventh grade, uh, um, you're studying the pre-modern world before the Industrial Revolution. And there's a fundamental economic fact of the pre-modern world. And that is that there isn't enough energy available in the world to produce enough stuff to give everyone or most people a good standard of living. That is, the only energy you have is either human or animal. And it means that in order to feed everybody in the society, 90% of the people in this society have to work all day long from, from dawn to dusk farming or spinning or doing some kind of task, repetitive task, just to keep people in food, clothing, and shelter. Those, that 90% of the people have to be poor, all right? But now there is enough surplus in, in some of these societies for the top 10% or the 3% or whatever to live pretty well you know, kings and pyramids and, and um, gold earrings and stuff like that. 
But um, one of the fundamental differences between the pre-modern world and the world we have today is that you could not have a big middle class because there just isn't enough stuff in the society, enough production in the society. Now when the Industrial Revolution comes and then you have machines and uh, power, uh, uh, fossil fuel power, then you can produce much more and you can, and you can spread out the wealth among more people. Okay, so this means, politically speaking, that there's a, the, the good thing, it's all the stuff of society has to be concentrated in a relatively small group and the rest of the people in the society have to work all day long at farming or some other repetitive task and not have very much. So they all, all of those societies have to have a system that supports and legitimizes that order, right? They have to justify it in some way. They have to make it right. The gods want it to be this way. You know, in your next life, you will be born a king. You know, whatever. You know, to keep to keep that society, to keep the um, uh, top elite in um, in power and securely, and to keep everybody else working. So that's a fundamental thing you can talk about with sixth and seventh graders. You say you couldn't really have democracy because how can you have democracy? Because people are going to vote. You know, that the rich the rich are going to lose their power and access, they're not going to support that kind of, you could not spread out the goods of society and have it come out like it would today because there just isn't enough stuff. All right, so you might use that as a theme also for um, the time. Okay, so um, now, uh, this means that in world history, in addition, fundamental reinterpretations of world history, and I'll show you an example in a minute, and then of course, new content and new sources. Okay. So here, let me give you an example of, of, of reinterpretation. I was taught in school, and I taught to generations of students, <laughs> that China was isolated from the outside world. Did you ever learn that? Yeah. Okay, it's not true. <laughs> I found out, well yeah, you know, it's basically based on the 19th century, the, uh, it was before the Opium War, when the British wanted to open China up to trade and the emperor didn't want to trade. Okay, um, and then it's true, you know, also that um, emperors um, didn't, uh, emperors could turn against trade, although some supported it, many did not, and the Confucians always were against merchants. None of that affected the busy people living on the southeast coast of China who never ceased trading. They started in ancient times sailing in boats as far as India and all over Southeast Asia, and they continued to do that all the way through the period. China's not isolated from the outside world. Yeah, they didn't get to Europe, but the Europeans didn't get to China either. It's a long way away. Right. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. When you look at the world, when you pull away from Europe at the center and you start really looking at the evidence, this is the kind of stuff I mean. Now what happens is, though, when you, when you first hear, when I first heard that, I went, no. No, China was isolated, I know that. And I started listening to the evidence. You know, I'm going, oh man, I guess I was wrong, you know. And then I was embarrassed because I taught all these students the wrong thing all these years, you know. I was really embarrassed. And then I got over it. And, and I decided, okay, right, from now on we do our best and we try to do it. So I just suggest, you know, to, you're all younger than me, but you know, I mean, you know, when you when that when it comes up and you go, no, that just can't be right. Uh, you know, look at the evidence, kind of, you know, kind of run it around your brain a little bit and see how it goes, because this is the kind of stuff they're coming up with. Okay. All right. Four themes um, in the world history, um, uh, in general, and that is the environment and society. So there's much more emphasis on environmental causes and consequences in the new framework. And might I mention uh, that uh, the, there are great lessons from the um, from EEI, California EEI, um, uh, to support the framework in there, and I highly recommend them. All right, second, states and power. This is the same as it was before, you know, sort of what goes on. Religions and philosophy. So this is the same too, except we're trying to pull it up to sort of a more analytical level. And then our last thing, increasing interconnection between regions over time. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit specifically about grade six, now that we know in general what's going on with uh, world history. So grade six has the same unit structure as the standards. All right. Inside the units, um, 
Uh, content may be different, but uh, you know, fundamentally the units are the same and the order that you know covered. The additions are the environmental connections, and there's much more about contact between civilizations. That is, it goes civilization by civilization, which I think is really the right thing to do in this time period because otherwise, you know, they are fundamentally divided from each other. But then there's a lot more about how they were also interconnected, involved in each region. And then last, Persia. Well, now Persia, Persia is a perfect example of why it doesn't work out too good if you uh, do Western civilization. That is the reason that Persia was left out. Persian Empire is very important all through history. You know, this area is really critical for a lot of reasons. But it always got left out because it's on the edge of Europe, you know? And so they just kind of left it out. Well, it's back in that. Okay. And it's very, very important. Okay, so sixth grade investigative questions. These, now the way it works is you have investigative questions for the whole year. And then for each unit, you have investigative questions that are a more specific form of the general question of the unit, okay? So you have year-long questions and then you have um, uh, unit questions. So here are the year-long <coughs> questions. How did the environment influence human migration, ancient ways of life, and development of society? So there's your environmental one. Uh, what were the early human ways of life and how did they change over time? And this is where you do the hunter-gathering, agriculture, civilization, urban society, states, empires, that whole um, development. And then uh, the next question, how did the major religious and philosophical systems support individuals, rulers, and societies? So this is the familiar question about covering religions, okay? But the, it's, uh, we're trying to raise the analytical level a little bit, that how did they support individual people, how do they support rulers and societies? That is looking at the effect they have on the society. And then the interconnection. How did societies interact with each other? How did connections between societies increase over time? So those are the questions, the theme questions for the year. Okay, now let me give you, a, we're gonna give you a specific example here. All right, and you might take a look at handout number one. I do this. So in handout number one, you have a section from the framework, okay? that um, uh, actually describes this activity that I'm about to tell you. In the framework, um, some activities are set aside in a box. We call them vignettes or teaching examples. Um, and it's designed to sort of walk you through what it would look like in a classroom, how a teacher would teach it. And uh, so you have this lesson here. Okay, now, um, uh, bear with me, and I'll have you read it in just a second. Bear with me. So now, we're going to deal in this lesson with two investigative questions. That is, uh, what are the early human ways of life and how did they change over time? And then the unit two question for this one, that's the unit on Mesopotamia and Egypt, would be how did people's lives change under the rule of Hammurabi and the civilization in Mesopotamia? Okay. So you know, what we're getting at here is Hammurabi writes the first law code. Well, he, it's not the first one, but I mean, he writes a really early law code. How many of you have ever used it in your classroom as a story? It's, it's really, yeah, yeah, it's really, really valuable. So, you know, this is just sort of another take on something you've used already before. So your question you're going to ask them is, how would that code have, have changed their lives in that way? Then the second question we're going to look at in this is, how did the major religious and philosophical systems support individuals, rulers, and societies? So, the question for unit two is, how did the Mesopotamian religion support Hammurabi? Okay. Now, um, before I turn it over to my assistant, I just want to point out one thing to you. I want to point out uh, that this is from the prologue of Hammurabi's code, okay? And um, the, we have just one section in here of, the, of a longer reading that you would give students, okay? And um, the, there are three, three names in here, Anu and Leel and Shamash, those are all gods. <coughs> all right, now what I would like you to do right now is I want you to read what the framework says. Um, about Hammurabi's code. Just read the example, the vignette, and then we're going to have you do part of it. 